All right, welcome everybody to our last lecture and our last talk this year. It's a pleasure to have Yasser Shaikh here today. Um, Yasser received his PhD in 2006 from the University of Central Florida. Um, he's been a, an associate professor uh, at the Robotics Institute, um, currently on leave at, uh, at CMU. Um, and Yasser is a founder and director of the Facebook Reality Lab in Pittsburgh, um, focusing on AR and VR. And he's actually been doing a lot of really cool stuff at the intersection of computer vision and computer graphics, of course, with a lot of machine learning these days. Um, he's publishing at the top tier venues and he has countless of really, really high impact um, publications. Um, I think his work, it's fair to say, has revolutionized human body tracking. Um, I think everybody knows open pose, convolutional pose machines. These kind of works have really accelerated the field and you know, everybody pretty much is building on them. Um, what's really special about um, Yasser is he has, he has built these like really cool setups like the Panoptic Studio um, at CMU. And I think if you're looking at the first slide here, he's probably gonna talk about these setups today. And I think that's very exciting because that's very special. Not everybody can do that. So we're very happy to have him today. I'm, I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Matthias, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, uh, thank you all for attending the lecture as well. So today I'll be talking about uh, photorealistic telepresence. Um, and needless to say, this is work done by the group and I'm really grateful to all the work um, and I'm simply representing it here. So um, to begin with, you know, humans are social animals. This is something which has become, you know, clear to all of us in the last, um, in the last six to nine months, right? We need each other's company. It's important for our health, for our productivity. Uh, for our happiness. And uh, it's incredible that, you know, not just uh, is it a need, but our perceptual, perceptual systems are also highly tuned uh, to extract incredible amounts of detail from the scenes we're in. So for instance, this is a, this is a photograph from a, a holiday party uh, from last year. And, you know, when you look at it, immediately we were able to sort of segment out um, individuals in the scene. Like there's this, there's this cluster at the back, that's one social group. There's another one here in the front where Hernan is gesticulating with his hand, with his facial expressions by leaning in, uh, talking to Hirsch. And we, we can segment these out as, as different groups almost instantaneously. We also look more fine-grained within this third group where James has said, clearly said something funny. And based on where he's looking at, you can tell he's, he said something to Dave, who, Dan, sorry, who's reacting, he's laughing, he's looking down. And whatever he said produced a reaction in Dan's wife, uh, she's responding with her facial expressions. She's smiling. She has this gesture with a hand on hand over chest. And, you know, there are a couple of interesting things I found this, find about this. The first one is it's clearly directed, right? This, this reaction that she has, it's directed back at James. Uh, and also it's a, it's a gesture that we all recognize innately. We know what she's, you know, saying it's not precise, but we get a sense of a message inside her gesture. But it's that we really don't have any words to describe it very clearly. And then finally, we can see um, uh, James's wife here, she's also reacting in a way uh, to the conversation. And we're able to extract information from her facial expressions, what she's doing with her mouth and tongue. This has meaning for us. And this sort of exchange of information, sometimes directed, sometimes undirected, is what makes us feel like we're in the space with these people. It's what makes us able to socialize and feel as, as if we're part of a group. Now, as I was saying, particularly over the last um, nine months, we've realized that you know, distance is uh, one of the major factors that impedes us from interacting and socializing with other people. In fact, I'd go as far to say that proximity often determines social relationships. Where you live and who you meet on a day-by-day -day basis, that determines whom you have relationships with. You know, we've all moved from, a lot of us have moved from one city to live in another one, or we have friends or family members who've done that. And we've seen what the impact of that almost, you know, like instantly, but especially over time, what that has on relationships. And so, I mean, this is not, of course, something new. This has been happening for centuries. And we've come up, slowly come up with ways of connecting despite distance, such as with the postal service. Um, and then for the first time in, in near real time with the telegraph, uh, the telephone then added this additional social signal that we have in terms of not just the message of what you're trying to say, but also something about the nonverbal signal of your tone, your intonation, those sorts of things in your voice as well. And then finally, uh, video conferencing. Obviously, the iPhone wasn't invented in the 1950s, but video conferencing was. And that's added another layer on top of telephones, which let you actually see the other person's face and interact with them, see their expressions, and hear what they're saying as well. 
yet with uh, with video conferencing you know oftentimes it feels like this image that you see over here which is in in sort of stark contrast to the original image i showed you of people in a scene engaging with one another you know th th there's kind of like a flood of social signals that is missing in the scene that you see over here it's hard to tell if Salim is actually pay, paying attention to what Mary is saying over here. There's no eye contact. You can't make eye, the basic sort of element of social engagement with somebody else. It's hard to make eye contact. It's hard to point in a shared space. All of that feeling of immersion is missing from this, uh, from this interaction. And it's one of the reasons why it feels so different. It feels like you're separated from other people uh, by, by a glass window and you're not sharing that same space with them. You're not able to feel immersed in that same space with them. It's hard, we don't have a vocabulary to explain it, but I hope everyone feels this. I feel this as the speaker today. This experience of talking to all of you would be so different for me if I was in a lecture room with all of you, looking at faces, gauging what the reaction is, making contact with people. You know, it's, it's a very different experience. And I, I would again con contrast to this feeling of being immersed in a space with one another. And the more I've thought about it, this directionality, this ability to kind of spatialize your signaling, pointing at things, looking at people, this is the key thing that's missing from interactions, that, from video conference interactions that we really need to have if we want to feel like we're there with the other person. So why is this of interest to us? Over the last um, you know, few years, there's been the ri rise of commodity uh, level 3D displays for artificial reality, which includes virtual augmented mixed, uh, mixed reality. You know, we've seen uh, the Rift, the HTC Vive, Sony PSVR, the Quest series and Oculus as well, and the Google, Day Google Daydream over the past few years. And in AR, we've seen the HoloLens, Magic Leap, and the new HoloLens 2 uh, come up as well. And so for the very first time, we have this opportunity for 3D displays that will allow us to have some sense of immersion. And what this talk is really about are what are some of the challenges that we need to overcome to be able to really experience being in a space with another person in a way that's indistinguishable from a real interaction in, in space. Of course, there are applications that have attempted to do this. And you know, uh, these are some examples of it. Uh, in, if you haven't tried these apps, I would really encourage you to try them. They're a whole lot of fun. They're very engaging and they're a lot of fun. But uh, you know, there is something that these leave to be desired. And it's true, despite an incredible demand this, this year for rem remote engagement, these sorts of social VR apps have in no way displaced VC, no significant way displaced VC as a means of uh, global communication, despite this potential for it. And one of the reasons is because, again, of that sophisticated sensing system that we have, how much we draw from people when we interact with them, right? That a lot of that signal uh, in facial expressions is preserved in video conferencing, but unless it's preserved while we provide spatial immersion, I feel like there's a game lost between them. And this example, this is a render of Danny with one of our avatars that we have. And if you look at it, there's a, there is an expression here, but I contrast it to the real image that was used to estimate this uh, expression from. I'll flip back and forth between them a few times. What I'd like you to do is just try to think about what each expression means to you. Like, how do you react to it? It's a very subtle difference. But in my view, this expression is very different from this one. And my reaction to this might be subtly different, might be very different, but this one seems like open and questioning. This one seems some, somewhat flat and neutral. And uh, it may drastically change the direction of the, con the conversation depending on context, or it might change it slightly, but it would have an effect. And with stylizations, what tends to happen is there's this constant source of censorship. There are some expressions, there's some movements, there's some uh, some signaling that's not preserved while interacting. And that changes the nature of the conversation. And that, that is one of the reasons why these sorts of apps, in my opinion, have not taken off. So the thesis of the work that we pursue uh, in our lab and in a number of other places around the world is that metric telepresence is sufficient for this kind of authentic communication. So if we want uh, telepresence to become a global means of communication, something which people really find useful to engage and connect with other people. Metric telepresence, which is another way of saying true presence is, uh, is important. So our goal is not to create something which is perceptually plausible, that just, just doesn't look good, but is actually what the person did. 
So in the example of Danny that you'd seen before with the, new, the neutral expression, and then the sort of like the, the open questioning expression, both of them were plausible, but one was what she actually did. And the other one was a plausible representation of what she could have done. What the statement over here says is, if we really want telepresence to be a means of communication, it has to be signal preserving. What you did is what should be shown on the other side. And both sides should have an ironclad trust of that. Just like we have with telephones, just like we have with video calling, just like we have with messaging as well. Yet, there is uh, an inherent contradiction uh, that, that, I, that I feel sort of encapsulates the challenges in this space. So the challenge is that we want to enable this kind of authentic communication, like signal preserving authentic communication in what is essentially artificial reality. And authenticity and artificiality, these are the two kind of operative words here. These are opposites. We want authenticity in what is artificial. And the system that we have to beat to accomplish this is probably one of the most sophisticated perception systems in the world, which is a human perceptual system looking at other humans, right? This is the, the height, the amount in which we can perceive is extremely high, as I had mentioned earlier. Uh, and that's what we have to overcome to convince you that what you're seeing is actually the person who you're talking to. So it may be worth um, looking at what the state of the art in digital humans is. And uh, a good place to start is in the, in the 1990s, Professor Kanade at CMU, he, he coined this term virtualized reality in which he built one of the, the domes that inspired the, the, the several domes that um, Matthias mentioned at CMU and, and other places all over the world. Um, and in this, he was able to re reconstruct games, people interacting and show that you could actually visualize them from different areas. Uh, in, in the 2000s, there was excellent work from, from Berkeley on teleimmersion. Uh, Professor Bashi and all um, did some work in trying to do this in real time with motion capture systems. And I should mention, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm re referring these two pieces of work as being illustrative. These are exemplars. There was a lot of excellent work happening at that time. Um, and, and it was a lot along these directions where the, in, the, in the 90s, there was a lot of offline work, multi-camera work. It started to become larger systems, but in real time. But the real breakthrough happened uh, you know, a few years ago, actually, with the HoloLens. Um, the, the team at Microsoft uh, proposed something called Holoportation, which uh, uses uh, stereo cameras in the scene and HoloLens to actually experience other people in real time as you see them. And this was a real breakthrough in the area and uh, you know, showed the promise of this kind of technology. Now, these sorts of methods that I talked about earlier, these are what I would call measurement heavy, right? Lots of cameras in the scene, motion capture or you know, RGB cameras, um, you know, maybe in, in um, the case of, um, of the holoportation, probably the fewest, but still, I believe, 24 cameras in the scene. In contrast to that, uh, there was also a more sort of model heavy approach, which used a rig of some sort and it was then drove that with much more impoverished sensing. And a, a really compelling demo was shown in 2017 called the Meet Mike demo uh, by a bunch of leading teams from around the world. This was followed up, up with some of the same people uh, led by Epic Games in 2018 with Siren. And then finally, most recently, there was a really exciting um, uh, uh, demonstration by Digital Domain, including a TED Talk in which um, Doug made a presentation with his live avatar as well. And so here, here's where we are. So what you're seeing here is a conversation between myself and someone else in the lab, Danny, once again. Uh, we're both wearing headsets with uh, specialized cameras on them. And this is what an interaction in VR in real time looked like for, for me and for her. Well, um, what can your face do? Can you show us? Well, I've always hoped you would ask me that question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I have some pretty good, I think, mouth movement. Mm. How about your eyes? Can you, can you look left, right, up, down? Mm -hmm. um, good, good, good. Yeah, I'm going to be surprised. Ah, ooh. Mm. I like my, I think one of my favorites is puffing my cheeks. Mm, the mouthwash, mouthwash commercial. Mm hmm And rolling my tongue. Mm. Mm, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah, not a lot and of people can do that. Yeah, one sort of good test is. Uh, so we, we go on and on, right? So it's, um, it, it's clear what you can see. There's a lot of the expression and um, uh, captured. And of course, like this is very different from actually seeing this in 3D in VR. 
there you actually get the sense that there's another person there. If you get too close, it gets very awkward. It's an entirely different experience in VR when you actually see something this realistic uh, in real time in front of you in 3D. So uh, this is a, a more recent result where we've actually driven um, uh, an avatar like this one. The face at least is driven over here. And you can see it's a full body uh, with the face, with hands, and even the background over here uh, is a rendering. And, and I'm showing you both views left and right uh, to, to reinforce that this is in fact um, uh, a 3D um, demonstration. So let's hear. And I came across uh, this video of this girl I went to high school with, and she's like, here's my attempt at beatboxing or whatever. And there was like three people, I didn't know who the other two were, but there was like one person like with a little like ukulele or whatever, like, like just strumming. And then there's another guy that was like, so like she was like, so the guy. So in this particular case, the face, the hands, the body, the background, all of these are, are, are renders. None of it is, none of these are real pixels. And uh, the face in particular over here is actually driven from, an, from a headset. The rest of the body is from the cameras that you see around it, but the face is actually driven by headset as well. So this is a this is a kind of a, a, an illustration of where we are. Now, underlying the the kind of our concept of uh, of of these this sort of telepresence is this notion of uh, a communication network that with our voice, with our facial expressions, hand gestures, body movements, it's essentially a communication network. And if we think of the the two people who are interacting as transmitters and receivers of information. Uh, we can we, we, we uh, and essentially separated uh, at some distance. The first step is we have to design design sensors that can uh, pick up this this information from the gestures and movements that the person is doing. In this case, cameras on a headset. We want to have an encoding of some sort to take this data uh, and encode the perceptual information about behavior, and then transmit this over the network to a decoder. Uh, and that's then shown on a 3D display to the person. And for reasons that I'll explain shortly, this decoder that takes in this kind of encoding of the, of the, uh, of the transmitter also depends on the behavior of the receiver. So it depends on both of these inputs. And I'll explain why in a second. And then finally, they have to, of course, meet in some environment because both people are in different environments. So there's an environment that also goes as input into this uh, into this decoder to produce the final view that the person will see. And then I have this circle arrow over here to, to indicate that this should, be, this should be a system with memory, right? So it should be something which looks at, looks at some history as well. Now, in our cl classic notion of separation of responsibilities, this encoder in a sense, sort of taking sensor data and, and sort of like extracting an understanding of the scene, this is what we typically call the vision problem. And then this, this problem of taking uh, a representation of a scene and producing images out of it or sensory data out of it. That's what we typically call the graphics problem. And I think, you know, almost every uh, computer vision and graphics course, or many of them at least, start with this kind of like relationship between the 3D scene and the 2D image. And then they motivated that the, the process of going from a 3D scene to an image is graphics. And the process of going from the 2D image to some sort of understanding or representation in 3D is the vision problem. Like this is vision is posed as inverse graphics or graphics is posed as inverse vision, however you'd like to see it. Um, and one of the things I want to say, like with uh, Matthias's work, with other people around the community, what we're beginning to see is that really uh, geometry is something that is common uh, between both of these two domains. And then in terms of appearance, neural networks particularly seem like they have a chance of using these two uh, uh, articles to unify how we're talking about vision and graphics. And I want to say this because in a sense, this motivates some of the design that we've done, right? And you will see how the, this relationship between um, uh, the, 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 the so-called vision part of it and graphics part of it, networks allow us to speak about them with a geometry for the first time in a common language, like a really meaningful common, common language. So uh, our attempt at solving this is something which we call codec avatars. And like we've developed our first ones in 2017. Um, and you can see there's some blurring around the teeth. We improved the resolution and detail in the teeth in 2018, uh, added uh, hair into this, into this representation in 2018 as well. In 2019, we worked on improving the resolution and detail around the eyes. Um, uh, most recently, we've been working on the hands and you've seen some results on the body in the background as well. So this has been a systematic um, development and there's a lot of interesting results. There are a lot of interesting results here. 
which I'll, I'll very briefly touch upon, but I'm happy to talk more about during the, the Q&A. Uh, and the last one, of course, I'd add audio in there as well. So we've started looking at audio as a joint problem in here too. So what is a codec avatar? A codec avatar is a pair of functions, which consists of, as the name suggests, an encoder and a decoder. So the encoder is something that takes sensory data of the person who's behaving and encodes it in terms of some uh, collection of numbers that represents the state of the person's uh, uh, body and pose at that point, right? This can also include audio information too. And so the, then the decoder takes this code, which is uh, independent representation of the state of the person at a certain time instant and produces whatever sensory data that you want, left and right eye, uh, you know, the image for the left and right eye or the ear information and so on. So let's talk about the decoder. Let's start with that and go a little bit deeper in to see what it is and what we use it for. So if we look at this function, uh, it'll produce you know, an image for the left eye and an image for the right eye. That's the output of this decoder function. And as an input, it would take that code, right? Some collection of numbers that represents your state. It will also take, as I had mentioned in the, uh, in the illustration, the receiver's code. So if I'm talking to Matthias, then, um, uh, and Matthias is looking at me. So if this was my face coming out, my code would be the transmitter's code and Matthias's sort of uh, pose and behavior would be the receiver's code. And then finally, there'll be some weights, of course, for this function. Now, of course, what we really want is not just the left and right eye. We also want the left and right ear. There should, there's directionality to audio and we want there to be spatial immersion as well. And of course, we want there to be an environment. So I should look like I'm in the environment that I'm rendered in, right? The example I'd given originally was in a back, black background space like I have here. But uh, in, in practice, we would actually want to have the avatar situated in a location and they should be relit and resounded as if they belong there. Right. And so this function is this decoder function I talked about earlier. The environment, the receiver's code, and then the transmitter's code produces the display. Now let's look at this, uh, you know, the code uh, is in this particular case, 128 numbers, and we decode it using a deep network to a mesh. So each of these um, uh, vertices, uh, it, it, it sort of um, uh, produces through a network. And one of the key kind of like uh, insights that we have, of course, is that uh, your appearance actually changes as a function of your expression as well. So you can see this picture of Shui in a neutral expression. And as he scrunches up his face, you can see blood rushing to his forehead, to his nose area, to his eyes. And that motivates saying that the same code that produces the mesh should also produce the texture for this individual, right? And that's what you see over here. There's the person's uh, geometry. There's the person's texture. It's the same code that produces both. And as we vary it, it produces both of these as output. And then finally, how do we learn the weights of these networks? We actually score them. We actually encourage them to produce the pixel values that are seen in images. In the beginning, you had seen this big multi-capture -cap system, which I'll talk about in a second. So the, the weights of the network are, uh, are, we search for them, we optimize for them to minimize the pixel error itself. Hence the, the concept of metric realism. We're trying to reproduce what the sensors measured as closely as possible. What you see here is a swiping between uh, the true image and the rendered image. And hopefully it's hard to see the separation because this is, um, this is good. Now, now compression over VC might make this harder to see, but um, I'm happy to send these, these images if someone is interested. All right. And here's what the code looks like. So you can see uh, an individual element over here. If we hold everything constant and just vary one of them, it produces this sort of movement. Currently, there's no real semantic meaning to any of these uh, elements, but this is an, an, an area we're interested in learning and delving deeper into in the future. All right. So now, why is it that I'd said that this decoder depends on the receiver's viewpoint as well? And then the reason is reflectance, right? So if something was diffused, meaning you look at it from any direction and it looks the same, you really wouldn't need that. But real faces, real bodies, real environments, it changes as you look at it. And if you see the lobe on the nose, as you change your viewpoint, it actually moves on where it is on the node and nose and here it becomes actually two lobes. And so that's the motivation for why the receiver's code should be input into this function as well. All right, uh, and so that, here's the change, right? You see this, the, the viewpoint of the receiver. So Matthias looking at me as he changes his viewpoint, it'll change the texture that he would see. It won't change the geometry, 
but it will change the texture and therefore we condition the texture uh, decoder on the viewpoint of the receiver as well. And here's an illustration of that. Here are many different views looking at a common geometry. And for each one of them here, we've unwrapped the texture. And you can see for this view, the areas that you know, are not visible, networks are lazy. The network doesn't bother to uh, decode them accurately, but where it does, you can see it's done a, done a good job in trying to uh, preserve realism. And, and we play this, you can see the geometry is shared between them all, but the texture changes in each direction to produce the different views. And so here is kind of like the, the, uh, the, the decoder pipeline. We have the expression code, we have the view code. Here I'm showing the geometry as a, as a, as a um, UV map uh, and the texture as well as a UV map. And if I play this, you can see we're changing this code and the texture changes as a result of it. And that's what produces the output over here. Right? The geometry is varying according to the expression code, the texture changes according to the expression and view, and that produces this image. All right. So how do we get training data for this? This is what we've built the system called MUGZ4. We want to sample the space of expressions and of viewpoints simultaneously. So for a particular expression, over time as it's evolving, we want to see what it looked like from every viewpoint. So um, these networks, deep learning networks, machine learning in general, this is in essence glorified interpolation. These are extremely powerful interpolation engines. And what they work really well on is if you sample the space which you want to see enough, these networks can do magical things. And that's what this, this system does. It produces that data that machine learning or net neural networks can use to actually interpolate any view for any expression. And this is an attempt at getting dense sampling for them. And so the system has about 100 microphones, 160 cameras, high resolution, high frame rate cameras, and 450 lights as well. Here's what the data looks like. You can see uh, expressions from you know, every direction, from the top, from the back of the head, and so on and so forth. And there's enough detail in here that we can see you know, what he's had for lunch. We take this and we run it through a pipeline to you know, do 3D reconstruction. This is a frame-by-frame multi-view reconstruction. And then from this reconstruction, we can also track it. And to give you a sense of the precision of tracking, um, this is of course a zoomed in view of his head. And I'd suggest like look at any point over here and it precisely captures the movement that we see. And this is in fact significant, right? Like we want to be able to capture that level of detail because of our perceptual systems being so finely tuned to movement, we need to capture this level of, of detail as well. And then finally, of course, to stabilize the system the, the emergence of these key point based methods, the stability of these methods has really like helped help stabilize the processing pipeline a lot. You can see we get individual teeth in there. Uh, we get um, uh, the, the eyes and so on and so forth. Right? You can see the teeth and the ears as well. So this is a full pipeline. It's uh, fairly heavy, but we've been, we've been sort of streamlining it to process the data as we capture for a large number of subjects as well. And here's an example, what you're seeing here on the left is the real image, on the right is the rendered image, and there's a line that's separating it, and it'll sweep back and forth. After a while, the white line will disappear, but it's still sweeping. And if you, can, if, you can, if you can't see the line, that's a good thing. If you can see the line, then, uh, then you know, there's some errors in there too. So I'm gonna sweep it. So it's sweeping, it's still sweeping, but it's disappeared. Um, and, but hopefully it looks, still looks like a, like a single video because it matches quite well to the data. And of course, like as we have talked about, it needs to be metric. And so what we're showing over here is the flip test, flipping between real images from different views and the rendered images as well. So you see he makes different expressions, we flip, and there are tiny errors. Like you see in this eyebrow, you see along the forehead, there's a little bit of loss of resolution, but in general, it seems to capture the, uh, the, what the person did precisely. At least this decoder is capable of making those expressions that this person did. Now, an important aspect of this, of course, is being able to make, to make the avatar appear like they're in the environment that they're supposed to be is relighting. And you know, uh, there's been sort of pioneering work over the last couple of decades by, by Paul Devick and others with the light stage at USC. And inspired by these sorts of approaches, recently there was in fact some uh, very exciting work from this, uh, from this team in 2019 called the Relightables as well. So like inspired by some of this work, we've also had light control inside 
uh, Mach Z2. So there are about 400 lights inside there. And uh, the data that we can collect now samples the space of light versus expression um, versus viewpoint. And here's an example of that sort of sampling. So now you can see the person's making many different facial expressions with uh, the light varying, as well as all of the viewpoints that we want to see. And using this, we can add this third code here, right? So there's the expression code, which, is, which changes the facial expression. There's the view code, which is where you're looking at it from. And then there's the expression code, which changes as you make different facial expressions. And you'll, you'll see this over here as the person, uh, you can see here, all we're changing is the lighting while keeping expression and view fixed. And I'll, I'll ask you to look at the specularity moving around the eye. This is a pretty interesting, exciting result from that perspective. And then now we can change two things at the same time. We're going to change uh, the expression code and lighting at the same time. So you see the person is changing their expression and changing lighting, but viewpoint is not changing. The texture changes as a result of it. And then finally, we can vary all three things simultaneously, the expression code, the view code, and lighting at the same time. And here's what you see over there, right? So the viewpoint is changing, facial expression is changing, and lighting is changing as well. It's very exciting. And once again, we want to see how well do we match real observations. Now here there's error, right? You can see there's error between what this thing renders and what the true images see. But it captures the, the like shadows, the rough structure quite well. There are errors, as I say, but it captures the structure quite well. There are some errors in the hair particularly, but we'll get to that in a second. And here's what it looks like if you combine this and sort of try to illuminate it with um, natural, natural lighting scenes. Obviously there are composite, compositing issues, but if you ignore those, this is a pretty, pretty exciting result. So speaking of hair, um, uh, this is some work that we did a couple of years ago in trying to get accurate reconstructions of hair itself. And so if you can see, uh, we can get sort of uh, strand accurate uh, reconstructions. And there's a bit of movement as well, you see here. It's not a lot of movement, but there's a bit of movement that this captures as well. And I want to stress again that the intent here is to try to reproduce what the person's hair actually is not just that it looks plausible or looks right. And you see here, if we do the sweep on a strand by strand basis, we're able to reconstruct what the person's hair actually looks like. Um, another representation that we've explored for things that are hard to model explicitly like hair is this concept of neural volumes. It's, a, it's kind of like a precursor to the, 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 the nerf surf movement that's taken off a lot. Um, and you know, I'd encourage you to look at the paper to read about it. But this was another way of representing things that are hard to explicitly model through this concept of uh, neural rendering over using ray margin. And here's a result from some of that. Um, so you can see here, we've gotten the, the person rendered, the, the hair is rendered through the sort of volumetric approach, and it's able to get the sort of soft uh, details and the, some of the compositing issues. Inside VR, when you look at this, it looks really compelling. If you, if you, if you guys, if those of you are interested in photography, it has this bokeh-like effect where the where the context is is blurred out, but the face itself is quite nice and sharp. And we of course combine these together to produce something like this. And you can this is a this is an example of a, a face with a mesh and then the the hair with these volumes. Hi, my name is Steve Lombardi. For those that don't know me, I'm a researcher at the Pittsburgh Lab working on codec avatars. The goal of our work in Pittsburgh is to create a system that enables social experiences in VR and AR just as you would have them in real life. When Yasser asked me to do the symposium right. talk, I thought, great, I'll let my avatar speak while I just sit on the couch. But I was told that I should probably show up. So please welcome Real Steve. So, so that's kind of like one half of the pipeline. That's, the, that's the, the decoder part. Let's talk about the encoder part now briefly. This part, which is perceptual, like how do we actually produce the codes that drive these decoders? Right. So that's the other half of this equation, of this function. So this takes sensor data as input, produces the code as output. And the challenge, of course, is that people are wearing these headsets. So that includes much of the face of the person. So uh, I was telling you that. I so how do we figure out what the person is actually doing? A lot of the previous real-time systems actually have are asymmetric. In other words, they expect only one side to be able to see in 3D. The other side's face is actually well uh, uncovered. You can actually see it. And that's necessary to drive these avatars, but it doesn't allow two-way communication, which is what we're after. So we, do, we devise these headsets with, ca with cameras on them. As you can see, there are four cameras over here. Each look at different pieces of the faces, like a jigsaw puzzle. And our challenge is to somehow take these and put them together into uh, a representation of its own. 
And here's where the challenge comes in. There is a, a correspondence problem here. Now we can collect a lot of data off the face from these cameras on the headset, and we can capture a lot of data in Mugsy as well uh, to see what the face, how the face actually deforms. But we don't have paired data. We don't have data which says, here's what the face was doing with the cameras, and that's the target we want to produce. These pairs don't exist because the face itself is occluded. So if someone was inside Mugsy with the headset, we still wouldn't be able to get ground truth. So how do we get this regression between the sensor data and the code when this code doesn't exist, when we don't have the correspondence between them? And this was the subject of uh, some work we did recently. I find this to be really interesting work and it sort of combines this problem of finding correspondences and learning the regressor into one kind of like uh, problem and solving it simultaneously. We take this image and using you know, codec, an initialization of our codec avatar pipeline, we produce the, the, the avatar of this person, a sort of neutral expression. We learn a domain transfer. So it's kind of like a style transfer to make it from RGB to IR, which is what these cameras are in. And then through differentiable rendering, we produce what it would look like from the perspective of these cameras. And we minimize the loss between these two. And as you can see, when the person is in a neutral expression, there's a lot of error, pixel by pixel error across the different views. But as you run the optimization, uh, what you see is that this loss starts to reduce over time. And in real time, you can see this expressed in the facial expression of this person. She closes her eyes, closes her mouth, and that decreases the error inside the, inside the view. Here, she opens her mouth like it is over here. It decreases the error once again. I'll play a few of these. You can see she slowly does it. I think it's really interesting to see gradient descent actually work on a person's face. There's something like satisfying about it. And that's what we're seeing over here. And here's again, once again, the flip test to say, are we doing what the person was actually doing? Is it right as opposed to plausible? And this is this error you can see, it gets the details of uh, facial expression quite well. There are errors, of course, you can see the tongue isn't well represented and that continues to be ongoing work. Uh, this actually runs currently in real time as you're seeing over here, this is an actual um, demo of a screen with uh, it running on the face. Um, and the, here you can see the full pipeline from the sensors on the person's head, we can encode it and then that uh, is decoded into a mesh and a texture we render it and that produces the image. And this is the end-to-end -end pipeline from image data all the way with the code to the output as well. Hi, I'm Jason and I'm a research scientist at Facebook Reality Labs here in Pittsburgh. What you're seeing right now is my codec avatar. So I'll, uh, I believe um, the, the talk was for, for 40 minutes, so I'll, I'll start to conclude here. Uh, you know, we're really trying to build this uh, network which takes sensor data like this, runs an encoder, transmit this code over the network to a, to a decoder, uh, which then decodes it to look what the left and right eye should see, and then that's displayed. And I find this from a scientific perspective, uh, like very satisfying, because the reason why we had this bottleneck was to make it learnable, but it is exactly what we want from a network networking perspective as well. We want a compressed representation. And so when we have this sort of like, we made a design for one reason, but it turns out to be amenable for a completely separate reason. It feels like we've stumbled upon something uh, right and worthwhile. So we continue to, to build this network across. Um, let me skip along, skip along a little bit to what's next here, right? What are we working on next? So we're, one of the important areas is of course environments. Uh, and this is some exciting work by Michael Zollhofer and some of his colleagues as well. Uh, where, you know, traditionally, if you look at reconstruction methods, you take lots of pictures of an environment, in this case, about 150 pictures with a DSLR. And then if you render it, it looks really good, but, you know, the reflections are not taken into account properly. Uh, there are big holes where there are flat areas. It's not super satisfying. But uh, with, you know, these new codex spaces type of approaches inspired by the NERF work that we've seen uh, come up recently, you can see this sort of a result. Um, and what's exciting is that you can actually experience this in real time. So I actually did get to visit Michael's uh, apartment virtually, thanks to, thanks to this work as well. It's really interesting. We're working on, on hand tracking. So hands are very difficult. There's a lot of occlusion. There's a lot of contact. Uh, it's just, a t uh, just one of the most challenging objects to get right. We've done captures inside our multi-camera system as well here. And you can see once again, um, using some of the works we've done on uh, physics-based regularization. This is at this year's SIGGRAPH Asia. Uh, we can get you know tracking results that look like this. You know this is highly challenging, 
what may not be clear, by the way, uh, is that this is, of course, a multi-view result. This is not from a single, a single viewpoint, which would be, of course, extremely challenging to do. But even with a multi-viewpoint, this is likely some of the most accurate hand tracking we've seen. And you know, things like contact, rubbing, these are always challenging. We want to get those right. That's been something which we've working on as well. And then the, this we've actually also made codec hands out of. So what you're seeing over here is a render, real, render, real. It's able to get this sort of information well. And it looks really compelling, actually. If you see this in, uh, in VR once again, this is, a, this is actually like a, a codec hand, which you can see in VR as well. And they look really realistic. Our percept perception isn't as uh, you know, fine-tuned for hands as, as it is for faces. Uh, so you get away with a lot. So the hands look even more compelling than, uh, than you would expect, or at least than I expected. Um, now, of course, you know, there's been a lot of work in trying to get these for full bodies as well. And what's very exciting is this work has happened across the, across the, across the world. There are many, many of these systems that have uh, cropped up, including in Germany as well. There are a number of these systems and a lot of ex excellent, exciting work happening here. We built another one of these domes in, uh, in FRL for the full body, which we call the Sochopticon. And this is the sort of data that it collects. This is a construct. It's our loading program. We can load anything from closing to... And so here you can see some of the results from this. We've built that whole pipeline out again, reconstruction and tracking and segmentation, uh, and then the learning part at the end as well. So this is a full pipeline as well. Um, just as uh, computationally complex as the face one was, this is an offline process to be learned for the bodies too. And you can see here, uh, the real challenge over here is how do we track that last 10%, right? Where there's a lot of challenging content and really get something exact. This is important because like crossing your arms, this is not unusual. This is something we do all the time. With our hands, there's always contact. contact. So we really have to, if we really want to make this something which is um, used for communication, we have to get all of those challenging poses. And it's a priority. It, it cannot be left as, yeah, it's just the last 10%, not important. That's where a lot of information lies. And so here is a, a result like I'd shown in the beginning. This is a, a codec avatar, the face, body. We can load anything from clothing to equipment, weapons, training simulations, anything we need. Is it really so hard to believe? That's the result I had shown earlier. And what you're seeing here is that she was actually wearing a headset. Right, what you're seeing over here is, a, nope. is actually uh, <laughs> driven from the headset nope. itself. I know, when I walked in, in energy, I saw with, uh, up, with hands, up, faces, like, bodies in the back. I should emphasize this is an offline result. This is not <laughs> yeah. done in real time. I was it's like, well, market um, I had talked about earlier, we have some very early results on audio as well. So this is, um, this is uh, a uh, the audio track. system inside Socioptican. And with that, we can, in fact, reconstruct the audio field inside uh, the dome as well. Here, what you're seeing is the 3D pressure, audio pressure field. We can sort of render what it would sound like if we placed a virtual microphone at any location in the scene. Um, you know, here's what it looks like. This is a construct. It's our loading program. We can load anything from clothing to equipment, weapons, training simulation, anything. And then you can see that the, that the audio waves, as it emanates, we can actually measure that as well. Currently, we're in the process of figuring out how we can actually incorporate this with learning methods, and we have some uh, exciting uh, early results in this direction as well. It's a very interesting problem because the avatar state, how your, your position actually influences the sounds that you make and the sounds that you hear. So these are all interconnected. The avatar, the environment, and the audio, these are interconnected problems, and they have to be treated in this way as well. So that's the that's this concept of our view of uh, of social interactions using codec avatars as well, and uh, the hope is that you know with this work um, we'd really be able to give people a chance to connect better, go beyond what video conferencing can give in terms of like seeing another person, but also making it feel like you're sharing that space with them. I think when most people think of AR VR, they think of yet another technology that's going to separate people into their own worlds and into their own sort of like isolated bubbles. But my feeling is this is profoundly mistaken. The potential here is to connect us and the world in ways that we've never seen before if we can just get this right. If we can preserve the signal and actually make it feel like you're there with that person. With that, I thank you for your attention and I am happy to um, take questions. Oh, awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot for the really amazing talk. Um, do we have any questions on YouTube? Uh, sorry, I mean on, on Zoom. <laughs>
let's start with some questions first. I have many questions actually, but I want to give other people also the opportunity. I'll start. Um, hi, thanks. It shows some really interesting stuff. Um, the question I have is, I mean, this line of work um, that you guys have at, at Facebook Reality Labs, uh, you've been working a lot with that 40 camera rig. And the question is, if we want to ship this out to the people in a few years down the line, I mean, there's a, I see at least a huge gap between um, capturing yourself in a rig like that and something you can do at home or, or like, uh, or something the person does when they buy this headset or something. Um, and even today, there, there's, I mean, we're getting pretty good at even doing this with a single camera, but we still have to do a lot of training and fitting up the model for something like that. And currently, I don't see it feasible, uh, like training a GPU for, for two days uh, just because a customer bought uh, the camera or whatever it is. So, so how are you going to tackle that? Yeah, I think this is an excellent question. And you and I are on, on exactly the same page. There is no way that this is going to become adopted in any kind of scale if you know you have to sit inside the scary system for a couple of hours, which is what it is actually. And in fact, you have to fly out to Pittsburgh to sit in a, in a scary system for a couple of hours. It takes about a week of processing, not two days. It takes a week of processing on a fairly large set of GPUs. So this is, I mean, there's no way that this is something which would scale in any way. And that's not the intent. Our plan is, of course, to get to a point where you can take you know, a phone, uh, take a scan of yourself, and then from that data, uh, it will use some prior information to build a model of you as well. And to that end, what we're doing is, just like we were thinking about interpolating views, interpolating light, interpolating um, um, uh, expressions, we should think of identity interpolation as well. How do we do that? We have to collect a large sample of, uh, of individuals, capture them, create their avatars, and then uh, figure out how we can use this data that we're capturing in the lightweight way, along with all of that prior data to produce a model of, the, of them. Our initial estimates say that, that the number of people we'd have to capture to be able to do that well is actually quite large, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to see if we can create this repository, this corpus of, um, of, uh, of avatars and, and see if we can interpolate data from there. I, I should also mention, you know, there are a number of solutions you see online where you can do this scan and produce an avatar of yourself. Structure is easy, okay? What's hard is reflectance, and what's much harder is expressions. So, you know, when you do these, it seems like, okay, that looks reasonable. Then you try to smile with that avatar, and it immediately looks like horrendous, right? It's this kind of generic, perfectly symmetric, creepy smile that uh, doesn't sort of catch your eccentricities that you really, like, especially when you're talking to people you know, it doesn't capture that at all. So in my view, the, the challenge of air is going to see how we can get reflectance properties that are right for the face and also how we can get the dynamics right. That's going to be very difficult to do with lightweight captures. And the real question over here is, uh, is the burden of data that we have to collect for the individual small enough, given enough prior data, that we can produce these avatars? This is a scientific question. We have to like do research to answer this. And right now, our hope is that, we, that the answer to this will be yes. Thanks. How many people I, do you think you need at the end of the day? Say again? How, how many people do you think you need? Hundreds, thousands? <laughs> Hundreds of thousands? I, I actually you know, take the, take the um, uh, lessons we learned with OpenPose quite seriously, right? I actually attribute the success of, um, of these sorts of key point detection methods for, for bodies not to us. I attribute it to the folks who did the hard work to collect the data and do the annotations. Whether it would be us, whether it be somebody else, someone would, would have done it. It was the point at which we crossed about 30 to 40 thousand images annotated. At that point, you know, all sorts of methods start to work. I think it's going to be something in the tens of thousands that we'll have to be at. So it's not a small number. I actually have another question, if I may. Um, is, is mesh plus dynamic textures kind of the direction um, you think is the right one to follow? Or do you think like, like fancier neural rendering um, ways that generate the final image just are a good direction. Yeah, so uh, we've, we've actually been sort of uh, attempting to do these nerve style representations, what we've called neural volumes for a while. And one of the real challenges over there is, I mean, the, the breakthrough with nerve was like the results looked so good, like the output looks so good. And there's some really interesting ideas there. The core challenge is how do you drive them, right? Because these are volumetric representations, they're not registered. 
And so what we found a big challenge on is when you have these volumetric representations to have them parametrized so they can be driven by external input, that's hard. Playing them back and showing a semi volume capture, this is not challenging. And I think that's exactly the right approach to do something like that. But if you want something which is compressible and can be driven by um, you know, input like sensor input to produce novel uh, expressions, novel behaviors, that's something which we found these representations are not that amenable for. So I do think some sort of a joint representation is going to be necessary, a registered mesh of some sort. Uh, and then for everything sort of like that, that cannot capture like uh, hair or some articles of clothing or a toy that you have on your hand, those sorts of things probably we want to go with the volumetric sort of augmentation to that. But the representation I think has to be joint, driven primarily by, the, by a mesh, a registered representation that you can drive. Thank you so much. Any other questions? I can ask, I have actually a lot of questions, but I don't want to take all your time. Um, there's one question is basically, um, I'm trying to reformulate a little bit on YouTube. Um, so the question is basically, why avoiding RGPD sensors and old school computer vision and go for deep learning? So what's the relationship? What, what is what is learned, I guess, right? That's the higher level question. What do you want to learn and what do you want to optimize for? Yeah, I, I think that's an, that's an excellent question. Maybe there are two or three questions in there. I think RGBD is a, is a good one to start with. So this one is one where, you know, like if we have D, I have no objection to doing it. Like if we're talking about like reconstructing it, but the reason why we need so many views is uh, not really to get depth. It is to actually model the, the appearance as you change viewpoints. Now, since we have so many views, we can do multi-view reconstructions and get depth anyway to actually a much higher resolution than you can get with RGBD currently, the way the way the systems are. So that's why we why we did it this way. Um, I do have in principle something where you know if you do have a compute budget, spend it on learning as opposed to uh, active sensing, which seems like a poor use of power. Uh, but that's more kind of a, a philosoph philosophical view. I think you should be practical about this. If in your application uh, RGBD is the right sensor, use it. If not, I would say spend it on learning. So that's on one side. I think the other question you asked is really interesting, right? Like so, the so-called classic pipeline versus the learning uh, learning approach for for some of these things. And I, I think the 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 difference is not that kind of like cleanly separable, especially with with recent work. There's a lot of optimization in a classic style that's being done within a learning framework as well. And those methods seem to be quite um, successful. Even the method I just described, which is of course a simplified version of our actual pipeline. Uh, we explicitly have geometry, we explicitly have texture. And what we've really used learning for is to replace classic reflectance functions, which in the, of themselves are also just function approximations. And my thought is that really what we're doing with networks is we're using the next generation of function, approx function approximators, as opposed to using these hand design, you know, function approximators for what is it like the uh, Lambertian model, the, the Fong model, the Oren Nair model, no, we're going to be, we're going to sort of just give the, the system data and let it learn a function approximation on its own based on the data. That's the way I see it. So I don't know whether there is such a clean separation between the classical methods and the ones that we're using over here. I mean, I think a lot of the methods now, they're basically doing multi-view stereo with, with, a learn, with a learning based framework, but they're not necessarily learning anything. Exactly. Right? exactly. Um, so I think personally, as a, you know, as a vision graphics guy, I'm like really excited about it because, you know, you don't have to learn, you just, you just have to optimize and you just have to formulate right. the problem, right? Um, I guess then the next question would be like, you know, like it, it's a bit the connection to the, to the first one, like how many people you need. What do we expect to channelize at the very end of the day? And what do we expect to capture, right? I think, yeah. I, I think that's, the, that's an excellent question, right? Like I, I feel like maybe if we could abstract a, a rule from, uh, from our experience with learning methods, uh, it's not a coincidence that the learning methods, deep learning methods have risen concurrently with compute and data, right? And where we've actually been able to reduce a problem to an interpolation problem, methods have worked really well. Like this, in, in our particular case, we reduced view uh, changes to an interpolation because we were able to sample it really well. So there they've worked well. Now uh, in lighting, we were able to do it a little bit. In expressions, we were able to do it. The, the question is in generalization, we should we should talk about that on problems where we cannot uh, interpolate. We cannot reduce the problem to an, uh, to an interpolation problem. Identity may well be one of those cases, right? 
Green lighting might be one of those cases. Like we have these sort of individual lights in the in the in our capture system. Will that actually generalize to lights that are very close by, very far away? Probably not that well, right? And I think when we when oftentimes when we talk about this difference between physics-based methods and learning-based methods, that's really where you prove your metal. Can you predict real sensor data that you would expect to see if a light source was here? You know, in other words, extrapolate uh, and generalize as you were saying. Uh, there, I think that's where we want to really get um, uh, physics-based methods, push generalization out of what we can't actually capture and interpolate on. It's not a, by the way, coincidence, the size of the dome that we design, it's 1.2 meters. That's the average distance two people stand when they talk to each other. That's why we designed it with that, um, that radius, right? Because we want to reduce this problem to, to be an interpolation. Yeah. Um, I, I got another small follow-up on this. Um, if we're talking about learning versus modeling, so let's say, I mean, currently a lot of the appearance and cue dependent effects are basically, basically all of them actually at the moment are encoded mostly in the textures, right? Or in NERF, it's in some radiance field or whatever you want to call it, right? What's your take on like how far, I mean, I'm personally a fan of, oh, let's model everything we can by hand kind of, right? And then differentiate through it. How, how far, how, where do you see the connection there? Like how much can we leverage from traditional rendering in a sense, like can we, feed in more known things for shading, lighting, and stuff like this. We, we know a lot of these functions, right? We don't have to learn them from scratch. I don't know, where do you, where do you see the connections there? Especially when you're talking about like the, the codec avatars and so on, right? Yeah, so I, I think my, my sort of bias is a little bit towards like, if we, if we take some of the language and semantics out of it, what's true? Like, what do we really know? Geometry is something we really know. That's the kind of like reality, right? If there's a shape, there's all of that business. Mm -hmm. And everything associated with that, visibility, shadowing as a result of it, those kind of things we, we really know because it's a geometric truth. That I think should be the basis of it. What we call, you know, sort of classic reflectance, I think we should, we should sort of like say, what is it really? A, a Lambertian model is just a linear approximation, right? It's not, there's not kind of like when we say physics behind it, it's physics in the sense of Hooke's law. It's like a linear approximation to a function. What are neural networks? They're function approximators as well. So wherever we talk about reflectance functions, I think we should just think about this as something that goes beyond where we were stuck with reflectance functions, very local, right? Very local functions uh, that we're trying to do because they're easy, easy to model and capture for. We've replaced them with something which is much more global and we're not in the business of designing what that's going to be. We let the network sort of learn how to do that. That's the way I see it. So where we, where we actually have some sort of truth to it, like real truth, we should, we should sort of rely on classic literature, classic methods for it. Where there is kind of like, it is in fact just a function approximator that we had, toss out the old fu function approximation, toss out the, the old kind of approach, and let's use our best tool. Let's use the best tool that we have for function approximation there. That's at least my approach to these problems. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you do have some ground truth on the lighting too, right? Like if you have, if you capture, you, you like, if you go more towards a light station, you say you have more control on that end, at least for the reconstruction, you could add that if you wanted to. You would know at least the light is coming from. Yeah, absolutely. Degree. Absolutely. Yeah, and in our work, that is what we do, right? So that when we vary the light, that's essentially exactly what we want to verify. We want to reconstruct those images as well. And that's why I'm saying, like, since we have access to that data, let's use networks. In fact, I mean, I wouldn't say we, that's our approach. This is essentially also what uh, the Relatables work did, what your own work has been doing as well. So this is, this is, I think, exactly the right thing to do. Let's, let's let the network figure out the complex interrelationships between how light interacts with this object, which are non-local, you know, and so on and so forth. Complex, non-linear, all of that business. So summary, all the hard part to give to the network and everything yeah. else to do our own. <laughs> I, I think, uh, what was it, uh, Jan's quote, um, gradient descent is smarter than you are. I think that's very true here. <laughs> All right, any, any other last questions? Does anybody else want to wanna ask them? Uh, hi, Matthias. I, I would like to, to ask a question. Uh, so I know that the talk is about uh, photorealist, photorealistic uh, component, uh, but wh what about the motion and sickness problem? Like, uh, so because I, 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 I understand that the, this is a problem in, in virtual reality and maybe the, like uh, the, the main problem. So the, the question is like, uh, uh, so, so like uh, if it's uh, enough only to the photo release to, to make something comfortable for a human, let's say like a, you have a conference in VR, can you support the conference in VR for one hour uh, with the device? 
Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic question. Ergonomics is really important as well. I mean, you're not talking directly only about ergonomics, but how heavy it feels, like do you feel tired in it? I mean, let's be clear, right? This is a this is a fairly big piece of equipment on your face. It's not currently, I think, comfortable to wear for hours. It certainly isn't. I mean, I've I have done it, but it tires you out a lot. Um, and then the, the next thing you've mentioned is motion sickness. So what, what I'll say about it is these are not solved problems, but the trajectory towards solving them is, is really good so far. So the early headsets, the number of people who would feel, the percentage of the population who would feel motion sickness was kind of high. But as mm -hmm. we've sort of like come up with the second version, third version, motion tracking has become better. The display has become high resolution, slightly wider field of view. These sorts of problems have started to affect less and less of the population. Now, will it ever get to zero? I think for that, we will have to have kind of, we'll see. Uh, it's unlikely it'll get to absolute zero. I think as the displays get better, as it gets lighter, as the motion tracking gets more precise, that, that amount will get smaller and smaller. And also one other factor is the more you use it, the more you get used to it as well. So the, the trends over there are good. But you also bring up an interesting point that it's not just about the work we've said, right? There is also this question of the display. Is it high resolution enough? Is it wide field of view enough? is the bit depth of the color enough? Like, can we actually produce high dynamic range images so you know really bright lights can be seen, the glints on your eyes can be seen? I did see some of our avatars on you know experimental high resolution displays and it blew me away. I mean, there's it makes such a big difference to see them in kind of like high resolution in 3D. So mm -hmm. I, I, it's not going to be imminent anytime soon, but in future versions, as, the, as commodity pressures make these things better, I think we're going to see some real magic there. It's going to be very exciting. Wow. Okay. Cool. Well, Thank thanks you. a lot. Um, I think we're we a little bit over time right now. So yeah, yes, it was really fantastic to have you. Obviously, I guess, I mean, it's very obvious that this is really amazing work and it's, it's really cool. I think that you're combining these like super cool setups for capture with like actual learning methods later on. I think um, that, that's really special and that, that I think really moves the field also forward. And we, we saw this in the past and yeah, I don't know. I mean, currently the null rendering is on a, on a really nice trend. So yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I'm gonna end the stream here. Um, and for everybody else who was watching, we'll see you probably or hopefully in the next year. Or so and enjoy Christmas and happy holidays. Thank you.